everyone. Welcome to Old News. My name is Laura Beth Spear. I am your host today. So I'll be keeping an eye on our chat and letting, letting Christian know if we have any questions. And of course, we have our museum's research curator of paleontology, Dr. Christian Kammerer, here with us to share the exciting news. And hey, Christian. Hi, Laura Beth. <laughs> Hey, so today's news is actually really extra, super special, exciting, because <laughs> Christian, you were a part of the discovery, right? Yes, I think, I think you can say that. Yeah, I am so excited. Yeah. And you've been kind of busy lately as well. Like I've been hearing about another species that you uh, co-described. Yes, <laughs> it has the past few weeks have been uh, a lot of my papers, descriptive papers have been coming out. Uh, the result of years and years of work, actually, but finally seeing the the light of publication. So there's one new animal that we'll be talking about uh, for the rest of this episode, uh, but there's also some uh, Dicynodonts from South America I was working on, and then also this animal called Carudia from Brazil that just came out, which would have been sort of a small lizard-like creature. Yeah, that one was really cute. That's the one that I saw a picture of. Yeah, just like a little little thing that probably could have fit into your hand um but the first the first of its kind known from south america so we're pretty excited about that yeah that's and, really exciting well um and today's is pretty exciting as well because we're talking about dragons mm -hmm. so christian i'll let you take it away sure um so this is or at least sort of vaguely dragonoid looking prehistoric animals um so we're going all the way back to the, the Permian period. So let's just situate ourselves here. Um, you can see the, our time scale here. Uh, so in recent episodes, we've talked about the Cenozoic era, the so-called age of mammals, which takes up the last 66 odd million years and discussed how even though mammals are the most prominent parts of sort of the, uh, the ecosystem, uh, nowadays, that mammals themselves actually have a much longer history than just uh, just the Cenozoic. So mammals go back for most of the Mesozoic era, you, over 200 million years of mammalian history. Um, but even that is only a fraction of the total length that synapsids have been around. So synapsids are the, the mammal total group. So that means everything more closely related to mammals than to like reptiles and birds. Uh, so this includes both mammalia itself and then all of these extinct synapsids like the famous sail-backed Dimetrodon um, that lived in the, the Permian period when these non-mammalian synapsids were dominant. They were the most uh, ecologically diverse, species rich and abundant uh, sort of terrestrial bony animals. So the, the vertebrates uh, in their ecosystems. And this is like, might seem contradictory when you think about sort of the, the arc of life on earth. It's like, okay, there's fish, then there's amphibians, then there's like the age of reptiles, then there's the age of mammals. But actually it was sort of the age of proto-mammals first, then they were nearly wiped out by this worst mass extinction in earth history, the end Permian extinction. And then reptiles take over afterwards, and including the dinosaurs. And then at the end of the Cretaceous, when they get wiped out, then mammals sort of come back in a way. So it's not, you know, it's not sort of a, a straightforward uh, sort of hierarchical uh, changes in taxa. There's constant, constant flux. It's, uh, and there's lots of twists and turns to their evolutionary history. Um, but Permian, it's really a fascinating period, it's the sort of the climax, uh, well, little climax of the, the Paleozoic. And the first time we really see extensive and complex terrestrial ecosystems. So these land animals, land vertebrates, at least they show up uh, in the earlier Carboniferous, um, but the ecosystems are pretty minor in terms of sort of like how many taxa there are, how many species, sort of how complex the ecology is whereas things really start to get going during the Permian and synapsids are driving a lot of this. And sort of the, the main group of them is this group, the Therapsida. So this is, these are the, you could call them, I guess, more advanced or more derived 
not really ideal terms, but things that are more closely related to mammals than to uh, things like Dimetrodon, rather. And so there are six major groups, what we call clades of therapsids, uh, that were around in the Permian. Um, the Dinocephalians, which are mostly large-bodied animals, uh, kind of lumbering herbivores with sort of like thick skulls, and so also some very large carnivores, the Antiosaurs. Um, this group is only seen in the middle Permian and then goes extinct. Uh, the Enomodonts, of which the most famous subgroup of that is the Dicynodonts, uh, which is a group we've talked about before on Old News. Uh, the, probably the most successful of the herbivorous therapsids. Lots and lots of species. They're known from every continent in the world. And although they do get hit hard by the end Permian mass extinction, they do survive and went on to sort of rediversify and last until the end of the Triassic. Uh, and lots of ecological diversity there, everything from little mouse-sized burrowing dicynodonts up to elephant-sized sort of like browsing giant dicynodonts. Uh, so a lot, lot going on with dicynodont history. And then you have uh, these three other clades that at least ancestrally are mostly sort of like large-bodied saber-toothed predators, including the Gorgonopsians, which were the top predators of the late Permian, uh, the Therosophalians, which primitively were large predators, but became very ecologically diverse later in the Permian and then even into the Triassic, uh, with some even becoming herbivorous. And finally, the Cynodonts. So Cynodonts, uh, they're the most mammal-like of the therapsid clades, and indeed they are, they are the ancestors of mammals. They include mammals as living representatives. Uh, they're also the only one that isn't very diverse in the Permian. There are Permian cynodonts, but there's only a few of them known, and they really diversify in the Triassic after the extinction, uh, possibly related to the extinction of Gorgonopsians and most of the Therosophalians that may have been competing with them. Uh, but they, they're very successful in the Triassic and eventually, you know, they evolve into mammals by the end of the Triassic. So also a very successful group. By contrast, the sixth therapsid clade, Biarmasuchia, um, it's hard to call them successful. I don't want to hate on them because they're a fascinating clade, uh, but they're very rare uh, and they're still fairly poorly known. Um, there have been a lot of papers written on Biarmasuchians. There's sort of like a high ratio of research effort to individual specimens, but there just aren't that many of them. Um, so the best known is probably Biarmasuchus itself, uh, which is from the middle Permian of Russia. Uh, but there's also a few of these things from Southern Africa where we find the majority of therapsid fossils. So things like Hipposaurus here, um, which is named maybe sounds like it should be a hippopotamus dinosaur, but no, it is. It's a, a smallish carnivorous proto mammal. So these, uh, these early Biomasuchians, they still look kind of like a Gorgonopsian um, vaguely, with in terms of having those big canines, not quite saber teeth, but definitely enlarged canines and would have been predators. Um, but these early Biomasuchians are actually uh, one of the smaller parts of Biomasuchian diversity. So the majority of species are in this group called Bernetiomorphs, uh, which are really fascinating animals. Um, one, just because they're such weird looking things. Like if you look at this skull, this is a pro Bernetia from probable middle Permian, maybe earliest late Permian of Russia. Uh, I mean, this, you will find few animals whose skull looks more like a, like a real dragon than these things. Um, I mean, even if you think like T-Rex and dinosaurs, I mean, they look, they look like kind of, you know, reptilian, okay, but I mean, this is, you could put this in a fantasy movie and no one would bet an eye. Uh, so just very strange things. Um, they're diagnosed by the presence of all of these uh, sort of what we might call <clears throat> cranial excrescences. So these are horns, bosses, uh, all sorts of thickened bits of bone. Um, these are all what we call pachyostost, which means the bone is very, is thickened beyond what you would see in most skulls, um, usually very dense bone as well. And in Bernetiomorphs, it takes the form of these horns over the eyeballs and off the back of the head, and then all of these, these bosses on the nasal bones and above the, the nostrils, um, sometimes on the forehead, sometimes even on the jaw bones. Um, so just very complex Baroque ornamentation uh, on these skulls. 
And there is, there's some diversity in Bernetia morphs. So here are some life restorations of these things. Um, you can see also the, you know, they would have been predators. They have uh, like the earlier Biomersuchians and Gorgonopsians and Therosophalians, they have very powerfully developed canines. Um, the art on the left reconstructs them with hair. We don't know uh, if these animals were furry or hairy or anything like that. Um, they're fairly early in therapsid development. So very, they, uh, in, if you look at the evolutionary tree of therapsids, they diverge long before cynodonts and mammals. So they may still have, you know, not had fur at this point. It's very speculative. Uh, but it gives you an idea of sort of like the diversity of the skull shapes and all the different forms of ornamentation on their skulls. Um, but the, the purpose behind that ornamentation remains a big mystery. And this is part of the problem with studying Bernetiomorphs is that because they're so rare, almost every species is known only from one specimen. So only a single skull, and I should specify only a skull, haven't found skeletons for these things, um, is known for any of them. So it doesn't let us say anything about sort of variation in the group, um, anything about growth in the group, anything potentially about, you know, whether males and females have different uh, styles of ornamentation. It makes it very difficult to understand how these animals lived. So just like their paleobiology. Um, they're also fairly restricted in terms of their, their geographic exposure. So uh, thus far, they have only been found in Russia and South Africa. Uh, for the longest time. So this is a map of the Permian world um, and just showing where those locations are uh, today. So there's a lot of the earth that we know basically nothing about in the Permian. And there could could be Bernetia morphs out there and their fossils just didn't preserve or did preserve and then were destroyed by erosion or subduction or any of these things. So we have for the past 100 odd years of knowing that Bernetia morphs exist, uh, been dealing with a very, very limited record um, that doesn't tell us much about their paleobiology. However, and this is where the news comes in, um, recent expeditions have started to change this. So South Africa remains the premier destination for therapsid fieldwork. Um, there's just so much exposure and so many fossils there. Um, but in the past 10 years or so, my colleague uh, Chris Sidor has been leading expeditions to Zambia and Tanzania, looking at the Permian and Triassic rocks there. Um, has found very diverse fauna uh, in the southern province of Zambia in what is called the Maduma Bisa mudstone formation, which is a set of rocks that extends from the middle to the, the late Permian. Um, these are found near Lake Kariba, which is the world's largest artificial lake, um, the result of the Kariba Dam. Uh, but thankfully, a lot of the fossil bearing exposures are still, still high and dry. So they've found a lot of fossils there. Um, including, excitingly, Bernetia morphs, and not just single specimens, but you know, dozens of these things. Uh, so it, it seems that you know, historically, it was thought that these uh, South African Bernetia morphs they were super rare components of their fauna, um, like maybe thinking about wolverine or a leopard today. They're not something you see very often in the ecosystem, and a pretty minor contributor to like predation compared to the plentiful Gorgonopsians and Therosophalians that they're sharing their habitats with. Um, but when we look in Zambia, there's so many of these things. And so maybe it is less that they're rare in all ecosystems and more that they are, they are common in certain habitats and not in others. And so whatever the ecological difference is in Zambia, and it's hard to tell, you know, that far in the past, um, exactly what kind of micro habitat uh, these animals were living in, um, but something about it was better for, for their existence. Um, and so they found all of these Bernetia morph skull caps. Uh, this is a, an illustration of one of them uh, from a paper by Zoe Kulik and Chris Sidor from uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and it, they were looking at the histology of these specimens, so trying to figure out how these animals uh, were growing, um, how their the pachyostose bone, how these bosses uh, were originating, uh, which is nice because you can do that when you have multiple specimens uh, for species where you only have a single skull. Generally, curators will not let you just slice it up uh, to look at the histology. Um, I certainly didn't, at least. Um, 
But uh, the bad part is, is like just having the skull cap is not as informative as having a whole skull. So there's all these skull caps being found in Zambia, but there had not been any like described complete skulls. And there still isn't a complete skull known, uh, but just a couple weeks ago, uh, I and Chris Fedor described this animal called Mobosaurus zambesiense, which is known for a mostly complete skull. It's just missing the tip of the snout there, uh, which shows that this is, uh, this is a, a new morphotype, sort of a new, uh, what we recognize as a new genus and species of Bernetia morph, um, with some very interesting ornamentation patterns on it that differs from all of the other previously known Bernetia morphs. So it was found in the, the southern uh, district of Zambia in the Zambezi River Basin, hence the species name. Um, and there are a lot of weird features to the skull shape, but the most uh, remarkable at least, which is uh, why we initially thought that it was a new genus and species, uh, is the morphology of the nasal boss. So this is labeled as NB in that little picture on the right, but here just to highlight it, it's this structure sort of coming off of the, the top of the snout. Um, very strange morphology in this thing. So it is, it's uh, very elongate. It's also kind of like lollipop shaped in that it has a, a narrow base and then expands into this sort of like big bulbous uh, kind of rounded uh, bit at the, the tip. So not like anything we've seen in other Bernetium morphs. So we're fairly confident that this is uh, a new genus and species. Um, I mean, the fact that it is, it's the first one named from Zambia and is many, you know, hundreds of kilometers from where they've been discovered in South Africa uh, also would, would tend to support that. Um, so in terms of the scientific importance of mobiles, it is, you know, it's just interesting for one thing to, you know, whenever we find a new species to learn more about the diversity of extinct life. Um, the sort of the, the biggest immediate importance of the paper uh, from my end was sort of resolving a minor controversy among therapsid specialists as to the sort of relationships between these animals, whether or not there are these subgroups of Bernetiomorphs uh, that constitute the, the probernetines that's shown on the left here, and then the Bernetines is shown on the right here. Um, but that's all pretty deep in the weeds for the, you know, the Biarmasukian specialists and Biarmasukian obsessed only. Um, so I guess I'll close, you know, saying that, you know, there's, there are important, uh, important results to knowing about the existence of Mobosaurus. Uh, but the biggest uh, I takeaway from this, I think, is just that we are finally have a sort of a way forward with learning about uh, Biarmasukian and Bernetiomorph paleobiology. So f when we had thought that they were super rare and that we were never going to really find more of them, um, we kind of threw our hands up and saying, okay, we'll never know if these horns and bosses are different between males and females. We'll never really know how they grew. We'll never know what they were used for. Um, but now with uh, what seems to be an increasing sample size for these things, we don't have the answers yet, but I think there's a good chance in the next five to 10 years, we'll know a lot about how these animals were living. Um, and it really just is, is very difficult to figure this out for animals that are so distantly removed from anything alive today, both in terms of time and sort of in the, the phylogenetic, their evolutionary distance there, um, that we don't have good analogs in the modern world. So like, for example, if you look at Parabernetia here, it has all of these horns and bosses. And I mean, you can think of something maybe like a big horn sheep where they bash their heads together. Um, and that's, I think that's unlikely to be the case for these things. So it's, that is pretty well supported that a different therapsid group, the, the dinocephalians were doing that. They have these massively swollen skulls that also look kind of like pachycephalosaur, the boneheaded dinosaurs, um, that they were probably using to fight with each other, whether that was over territory or food or over mates, that's still hard to say, but we can say that there was, there was aggressive activity going on. Um, whereas in these Bernetiomorphs, a lot of the structures are very delicate. They're not the sort of thing, you know, even though they're made of solid thickened bone, um, something like that, the thin nasal boss in Mobosaurus seems like it would break pretty easily uh, if it was having a lot of pressure on it. So maybe these were just uh, like a lot of display structures today. So um, mate choice based on who has the most elaborate headgear 
or to recognize other members of your species rather than a potentially lethal encounter with a, a different type of Bernetia morph or a Gorgonopsian or something. So those are all sort of the, the hypotheses that we're gonna be testing as we learn more uh, about these Bernetia morphs. Oh man, that is so exciting. And I really like that last picture that you showed. Um, that was pro Bernetia? Uh, what picture was that? Para Bernetia, but para it's-, Bernetia. it's uh, So they're, they're both pro Bernetians, this Bernetia morph subgroup. Um, pro Bernetia is from Russia, para Bernetia is from South Africa, but closely related animals. Mm -hmm. um, and also like, you have to remember that this is Pangean times. So it's all one big supercontinent. These animals can freely disperse from the Northern to the Southern hemisphere. Um, they're not, you know, the individual species in general are pretty localized, but the groups in general seem to have been <clears throat> present worldwide. Mm -hmm. Man, it looked like I was getting ready to do a push up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I mean, that's a, so these early therapsids, they have a very strange posture. Um, and where, I guess, it, in that art, it's assuming that that is the case for Bernetia morphs as well. As I mentioned, we don't have any skeletons of them. Uh, yet at least there is there is probable sort of new skeletons that have been collected in the past year or so that may uh may tell us what they their post cranium looks like mm -hmm. um but the early therapsis is a very strange posture uh which is that they have sprawling forelimbs and uh sort of vertical hind limbs so it's a combination of what you might see like sprawling limbs what you see in a lizard or a crocodile or something where they come um, out away from yeah. the chest and their body okay Whereas in a, like a bird or a mammal, uh, they have the vertical or erect hind limbs. Um, they stand think about like a, a horse or a cow or something, or even like a dog, you know, they're standing straight up. Um, therapsids do with the half and half. So the, and if you're looking at a Gorgonopsian or a Dicynodont or a Dinocephalian, all of these things, uh, they have sprawling forelimbs, but mostly erect hind limbs. Um, and it's not until late in Cynodonts, even into mammals that you start to get, you know, both of them uh, being fairly high up. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's another thing that? where there's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, do we see that in any other creatures? No, I mean, I mean that's, the, that's the problem. It's like nothing alive today. So it's very difficult to reconstruct their locomotion. Weird. It's thing where you just have to operate from first principles, uh, trying to figure out the physics of these things more than uh, being able to make analogs make comparisons to things mm -hmm. like today and speaking of that um, their skulls if they're so thick and heavy or at least some of those uh mm -hmm. Bernetia morphs do you think that you know the rest of their body and even their tail had to kind of be a counterweight to that so that they wouldn't like fall forward or is that just silly? so in in these animals it seems like no uh again we don't know too much because we don't have the skeletons, but there are a few vertebrae from the neck at least known. And the necks are, uh, there's one animal in particular called Lobalopex, which is an early Bernetti morph. Um, and the neck vertebrae are actually pretty elongate. So they're pretty thin and narrow. So it doesn't seem like they're pulling up a huge amount of weight. So, I mean, part of what is going on is that the, the skull in Bernetti morphs, even though it has this pachyostosis, it's very localized. So it's into it's in horns, it's in a few of these bosses, it's in mm -hmm. like flanges. But the rest of the skull is quite lightweight. So within the nasal cavity, within the the jaw, and within the the sort of the base of cranium, um, it's all a very lightly built skull. Uh, if you look at dinocephalians and the big dicynodonts, by comparison, those things have massive skulls. Um, so dinocephalians have very thick pachyostosis as well, but it covers in some cases the entire skull. Uh, Dicynodonts generally don't have pachyostosis, but they just have a really massively built skull. And they also often have giant tusks, which would have been very heavy. And if you look at those animals, they actually have very strongly reinforced neck vertebrae. So, and also like huge sites for muscle attachment on the back of the skull. So it seems like if you look at, you know, kind of like zebu cattle or bison today, where they have these almost like humps um, and just like enormously thick muscles and sinew on the neck in order to hold those skulls up, mm -hmm. uh, that would have been more like a dicynodont or a dinocephalian. Whereas these Bernetia morphs, they were probably pretty gracile. Okay. Um, okay, so we have some really cool questions in the chat. Okay. Sam wanted to know, um, what does 
mobasaurus mean? What is that part? Uh, so uh, it means sort of like knob horn. So moba is the local name in Chitonga, uh, which is the, the language of the Tonga people uh, who live in southern Zambia, in other countries as well, but live in the area where it was where the specimen was discovered. Uh, and it refers to a, a specific type of tree that lives in Southern Africa, the knobthorn acacia. Um, so it's a, one of the acacia family, which is a very diverse group of trees, very common uh, in uh, African savanna ecosystems, uh, some of which are known for having spines all over them and uh, partnerships with ants to prevent uh, herbivores from eating them. But the knob thorn acacia, the, the thorns are very sort of like thickened and they, they're just like these little knobs on it. So because Mobosaurus, and hold on a second, I've got, I have a 3D print of Mobosaurus here so you can see, see the skull. So, oh, so the, that's, the, that's the nasal boss. Yeah, so you've got the nasal boss right here. And, but even like the rest of the uh, bosses, like here's the post orbital boss and the super orbital boss here. They're exceptionally knob-like compared to other Brenneniomorphs in this thing. So Ceres is Greek for horn. It's the same root that you'll see in like Triceratops, three-horned face or Ceratopsian dinosaurs. Um, so if, all in all, it's uh, it means knob horn uh, as sort of the distinctive feature of this animal. Um, man, that is so cool. And how'd you get that 3D printed skull? Did you do that at the museum? Uh, so I did, I did the scanning of it a few years ago. Um, but yes, the specimen, like the, the 3D print itself was done uh, with our 3D printer at the paleo lab at the museum. Very cool. I love it. Um, all right. So. And I should mention that this is much smaller than it actually, the actual oh, specimen. Right, yeah. So, so is, how, how big would it actually be? So the, the whole skull of this thing would have been uh, maybe like 12 inches long, maybe like 30 centimeters long. So it's not a huge animal. Um, would have been sort of like dog sized. Yeah. Um, but it's not like tiny like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, one of our participants actually pointed out that they do look like dogs in that one picture. I know that that was a different species, that mm -hmm. we were looking at, but you know. Um, well, yeah, the cynodonts, they, well, that, that name means dog teeth. So there is a, there is sort of a, there's the dogishness about them for sure, even though they're much more primitive. And um, Christian, you kind of, had a hand in picking our logo for old news uh -huh. and is it a dicynodont? uh that no that is it's a sphenacodont so it's dimetrodon oh okay okay i was so, way off <laughs> yes so is is a synapsid um but is uh inspired by the skull of dimetrodon cool which is ar arguably the most iconic of all mammalian synapsids with that big sail back yeah yeah so that's from the early Permian, though. So that's well before the, the therapsids evolved. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, getting to more of our questions, Sam asked about the skull of uh, Mobosaurus. It was like, mm -hmm. it was reddish. Um, oh, yeah. It's really pretty, I thought. And why does it have that red color? OK, so that is, uh, so fossils uh, take the color, basically, of whatever elements are in the rock when they're getting fossilized. So uh, the fossilization process is, you know, organic material and bone is buried and then is replaced over thousands to millions of years by uh, the surrounding rock. So where this animal was found, this part of the Maduma Bisa mudstone formation is very rich in iron. So most of these fossils are found as nodules encrusted with hematite. So hematite is this very characteristically red uh, iron rich mineral. Um, that has completely permeated all the fossils there and also makes them very difficult to prepare because you're it's ironstone that you're trying to dig through to clean it off. Um, and as a result of that, uh, the fossil itself has taken on that red color of the hematite. Mm -hmm. So and yeah, so do you have to use any more um, any tougher tools when you're out in the field like to excavate it? So for your hematite? It's uh, not really um, for specimens like that. They they're collected as nodules. So you'll see basically a football sized thing on the ground. And if you see bone sticking out, you just pick it up and put it in your bag. Um, if they are in situ, that is in the rock and the rock is hematite, it is very difficult to collect them. 
Do you um, know where those get collected at all? Uh, they they've been known to. There have been a some. There have been some, but generally, uh, you wouldn't if they were if they were large, especially. There's one gigantic di uh, Dysonodont skull um, from Zambia at a museum in South Africa uh, that I don't know how they collected because the thing is like a meter long. Um, they have not prepared it and the, they, cause that would be years of work. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have a suspicion what kind of Dysonodont on it is, but right now it's just like this giant mass of roughly triangular hematite that they think a skull is in. So you, um, you'll get to study that? Oh, I mean, I, I have studied it in, in so far as I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, I've looked at the specimen. Scans on that uh, so you can't CT scan them if they're in hematite because uh, iron and other metals bounces off. Uh, so CT scanning is just a complex form of X-ray that's done in three dimensions. So X-rays bounce off of metal, or at least most types of metal. So if you put something that is made of metal into a CT scanner, you won't get any internal structure there. So what you can use neutron scanning, which is a different technique, which I have used on hematitic fossils and can work very well because it's not x-rays going in there. It's, it's neutrons, which are you know neutral subatomic particles that they zoop right through the, uh, through the metal. Um, and so you can sometimes get internal structure there. But yeah, you couldn't CT scan these things. And their neutron scanner can't take very big objects. So a skull like a meter long covered in hematite, there's no way you're ever going to be able to scan that. You really just need to have it prepared. Um, that just takes a lot of, lot of labor. You can shorten that uh, by, so like for Mobosaurus, I know that specimen was given an acid bath before preparation started. Mm -hmm. So acid preparation is widely used in paleontology to help either if it's a soft rock like limestone to dissolve the surrounding matrix altogether, or if it's a very hard rock, hematitic rock, for instance, just kind of to soften it up uh, to allow mechanical preparation. So for this one, really just was used to get kind of some of the external rind off, soften it up, and then just went through with the regular paleo prep tools of uh, drills, picks, micro jack, that sort of thing, air scribe. Um, in order to to just prepare it by hand, so there was no no particular tools used for a hematite specimen that you wouldn't use on other fossils. Mm -hmm. Oh man, um, when you say something like neutron scanner, I feel like like we're in the future. Like we're in the <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds so crazy. Well, um, I mean, scanning technology has improved by leaps and bounds just the past 10, 20 years and is continuing to ramp up. And it really is revolutionizing anatomy in general, but particularly for fossils. So uh, yeah, I mean, we are, we are living in the future in that <laughs> regard. That is so cool. Um, okay, so Martin had a great question. What are the other fauna that are found in that locality? Oh yeah, that is a good question. Mm -hmm. So it, one of the ways we know that Mobosaurus is middle Permian is that the most common fossils that we find with it are dinocephalians. So there are lots of isolated teeth uh, that my colleague Chris Sidor and his crew have collected in this region. Some of them uh, very close to where Mobosaurus was found. Um, so uh, these would have been big, maybe like rhinoceros sized herbivores. These are the ones that have the kind of the dome skulls that they were probably using to, to fight each other. Um, there are also some dicynodonts known from there. This is fairly small ones. Uh, there's an animal called a bajudon, uh, which is from not the exact same site as Mobosaurus, but similar uh, region. Mm -hmm. And so these small uh, herbivores uh, like dicynodonts would have been there. Mm -hmm. So all in all, you know, it, as a fauna in total, it's pretty similar to what you see in the Middle Permian in South Africa as well. So even though there's different species, this like the larger groups, the families are more or less the same. Mm -hmm. And you may have already mentioned this, so forgive me if I'm being redundant, but for Mobosaurus, you know, its teeth kind of they didn't quite look exactly like an herbivore's teeth, you know, that are wide and flat and kind of mashing, but they also didn't look like sharp razor knife teeth of, you know, something like mm -hmm. a T-Rex. So what was it eating? I feel like I can't really make a great guess. Well, for, for Mobosporus itself, we don't have 
all the teeth preserved because like the canines, for instance, they would be in that part of the, the skull, the snout tip that's missing in the mm -hmm. specimen. Um, but in the other Bernetia morphs where we do have complete skulls, things like uh, para Bernetia or pro Bernetia, um, they have they have fairly typical sort of like blade-like, you know, recurved, uh, sharp conical teeth um, that are similar to what you see in Gorgonopsians. So I think you know them being predators is is by far the most most likely interpretation there. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right, so I'm um, getting a little bit off topic, but not totally because it's still mm -hmm. about dragons. Um, Jackson had a great question at the beginning of the program. So he just wanted to learn more about Draco Rex Hogwartsia. Okay, yeah. So that's a, that is a controversial species of dinosaur um, mm -hmm. that was described some years back. Uh, so it's, it's Pachycephalosaur. So it's another one of these uh, elaborately ornamented animals. It's, uh, those are the, the boneheaded or the dome-headed dinosaurs. Um, and it was just, it's from the same beds where Pachycephalosaurus is found. So in, out in the Rocky Mountains, Lake Cretaceous uh, from the, the Hell Creek formation. Mm -hmm. And it was distinguished from Pachycephalosaurus by having a very low skull without the dome, by having more sort of like spikes on the skull, by having the, these holes in the back of the skull, which seems like a lot, um, but it's also a much smaller skull than Pachycephalosaurus. So the, uh, what a, a lot of uh, dinosaurologists have now argued, and I am inclined to agree with them, is that uh, Draco Rex is actually just a, a baby Pachycephalosaurus. So that uh, Draco Rex is kind of the juvenile. There's another uh, formerly distinct genus called uh, Stygemaloc that is maybe the teenager, and then Pachycephalosaurus is, is the full adult. Um, so I think Draco Rex, unfortunately, although it's a great name, is probably not a distinct genus. It is the, the same thing as Pachycephalosaurus. There may still be species level variation going on there. So like mm -hmm. from the base of the Hill Creek to the, the top of that formation, I mean, you do see variation in like what Triceratops species is present. So like the, the very latest Pachycephalosaurus, you can make the argument that it's a different species than, uh, you know, the original Pachycephalosaurus wyomingensis. Mm -hmm. But I think it'd be, it'd be difficult to argue any more than that. And can you clarify really quickly um, what you meant by a, saying a low skull? Yeah, so uh, Pachycephalosaurus, it has a very tall uh, skull profile. So where it has that, just like the giant dome coming off of the top. And then the snout is also relatively tall. Whereas in Draco Rex, it lacks the dome and the skull itself is much more slender than in the adult. Um, and that is, that's something you see in some living reptiles that the, the skull gets bulkier and more massive as they get larger and reach adulthood. So I don't think it's unreasonable uh, for that to be the case in dinosaurs as well. Mm -hmm. And um, this will have to be our last question because we're almost out of time, but uh, you know, we're talking about dragons and myths and stories. So do you know, um, are there other cultures that have dragon myths besides the Chinese. And I wanted to add on to that. Um, you know, I've heard that dragon myths often come from actually finding dinosaur fossils. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any myths that are specifically coming from this group of animals that actually, you know, has skulls that look more dragon-like? Oh yeah, okay. So there's a few things to talk about there. Yeah, um, don't worry, we've got like... Yeah, so I mean, dragons, they're not a homogeneous concept. I mean, I'm speaking a little outside my range of expertise in sort of mythological history, but there are sort of chimerical, flying, reptilian, powerful monsters. Basically, every society in human history has come up with that at some time or another. Um, you know, there are a lot of distinctions between what you might call Eastern and Western dragons. But even, you know, if you're looking at Mesoamerican cultures, at African cultures, um, in South Asia, there are a lot of things that could, you could call dragons. Um, whether any of those are related to dinosaur bones, I'm fairly skeptical, but I think there is good evidence that they're related to fossils. So just to make the distinction there, um, I mean, the, the best sort of like paper trail for a lot of this is in medieval Europe. Um, and there are some cases where we know directly the origin for a given dragon myth. 
Um, there's one in there's in Germany and what, well, what is now Germany and Poland um, for the skulls of woolly rhinoceroses. So Celadonta, this uh, Ice Age megafauna that used to live across Eurasia, that skulls of those were specifically held up as being from dragons and evidence of dragons. Um, and there's also evidence from ancient Greece of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, of various fossil mammals, mostly things like uh, mastodon type things that were being considered dragons. Um, so no dinosaur fossils. It has, it's, you'll often see like, oh, like in, uh, in China in the early 20th century, dinosaur bones were, were ground up as medicine. And that also doesn't seem to be the case. Like there mm -hmm. were fossils, um, but they're mostly mammal, like Cenozoic mammal fossils as well that were, that were used in medicine. Um, and the, so the, like the connection to dinosaurs is pretty tenuous as for Bernetiomorphs, I am fairly skeptical over whether, you know, they have had any influence on human civilization prior to like their discovery in the 1920s. Right. Um, yeah. they're so rare. There isn't like, so like the chances of one of them weathering out enough to like really see the skull without preparation is is pretty low mm -hmm. like with these woolly rhinos and mammoth skulls like those are in they're like melting out of permafrost or they're weathering out of a hillside and yeah, like coming out of sand mm -hmm. um you know they're recent enough that it, it doesn't take a skilled preparator in order to reveal them onto the world um whether any of these like the, the South African basin is so rich and there are so many fossils weathering out all the time that it is like Dicynodons, for instance, you'd think that uh, early human inhabitants of the region would have would have seen them and known about them. Uh, but unfortunately, there isn't, you know, in uh, sort of anthropological and studies of the area, there isn't really anybody talking about fossils. Um, and you know, the, the sad fact there is that so much of the the social history of those groups was lost during European colonization and like the subsequent apartheid era uh, that a lot of, of that history is, you know, may never be recovered. So we don't know anything about what uh, the native people there thought about fossils. Um, so yeah, really, really hard to say whether, you know, therapsids have, have made a mark on, on human consciousness, but uh, I like to think they do today. And so hopefully we're, you know, raise their profile, get more people thinking yeah. about the rhapsids and also, you know, going out there and trying to find more of them. Yeah, definitely. It's time to put some therapsids on a t-shirt, y'all. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Make some movies about therapsids. Um, man, yeah, well, I, I, I heard tell, Jurassic, new, new Jurassic World, gonna have Dysonodonts. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Thank you, Christian, so much for giving us that quick overview of, um, you know, the cultural connections between dragons and fossils and all that. I didn't realize there were so many different types of fossils that inspired the myth. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's very cool. And thank you, of course, everyone for joining us. Thank you, Christian, again, for sharing your expertise. Next month on March 9th, um, check your or yeah, check your calendars. Uh, join us on March 9th. We're actually going to have kind of a special edition of old news um, because it's going to be happening during the museum's big virtual event, Reptile and Amphibian Days. So, you know, as usual, we won't know exactly what the discovery is going to be until, you know, we get closer to the program date, but we are definitely going to try to highlight some, uh, some really cool fossils from, you know, reptiles or amphibian paleobiology. So we're really excited. Um, don't forget you can you can register for that program on our website and if you register you'll get a reminder email, you'll get the topic description, you'll get bingo cards. Congratulations Jackson for winning bingo and learning a new vocabulary word to stump your teacher with. That's awesome. <laughs> Pachyostotic bone. Good one. Um, all right so thank you again everyone and have a great day. Stay safe. Yeah. Thanks for coming by, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.